Hello and welcome to this uh, live stream event. Uh, this is Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief editor of JAMA, and I'm here with Tony Fauci, uh, the Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and we're obviously, uh, once again, going to talk about the novel uh, coronavirus um, epidemic, now pandemic, uh, that's occurred in China and now is sadly moving uh, around the world. Welcome, Tony. Good to be with you, Howard. I, I want to thank you for joining us. I know you're busy. You've been on a lot of different broadcasts. You know, this one is really focused for physicians and other clinicians. So I, I really appreciate that you've taken the time. Before we start, I just wanted to mention to the people who are watching this, it's streaming on YouTube and Facebook. It will be live as a podcast sometime early tomorrow morning. John has currently published um, three pieces. The first, uh, which was in fact uh, by Tony with his two uh, co-authors, uh, Hilary Marston and uh, Catherine Paulus, was uh, coronavirus infections more than just a common call. That was accompanied um, by another viewpoint um, by Larry Gostin and uh, his two co-authors, Rebecca Katz and Alexandra Fallon, entitled The Novel uh, Coronavirus Originating in Wuhan, China, Challenges for Global Health Governance. We put up a, uh, another viewpoint early yesterday by Carlos Del Rio and Preeti Milani entitled 2019 novel, Coronavirus, Important Information for Clinicians. What I want to alert the listeners uh, and people who are watching is we are putting up two uh, very important papers tomorrow morning. The first um, is a long research report entitled Clinical Characteristics of 138 Hospitalized Patients with 2019 Novel uh, Coronavirus Infected Pneumonia in Wuhan, China. We think it's the largest um, case series to date, and it has some really important information in it. Uh, I would just comment, we held up publication for a day or two, because there were one or two critical facts that we really, really wanted to make sure were correct. But just to highlight um, two of the findings, the first is of these 138 uh, patients, 36 ended up in the intensive care unit. And so there's quite a bit of details about the complications of the, these 36 patients. And the other, which is using a, a, a preliminary def, definition, was that um, almost 40% of this sample of 138 uh, hospitalized patients um, were infected by individuals who uh, had come to the hospital and were infected. Now, th this is a, a, a presumed uh, figure, but it's quite high, and I think um, it will be of interest to all of the readers. So, Tony, you and I corresponded yesterday a bit. Why don't we start uh, the big picture and then walk through it, and then I know I have some other specific questions. So, as of this morning, about 28,000 infected individuals worldwide, over 500 deaths. Where, where do we stand with respect to China? Well, you know, China has the overwhelming bulk of the infections. And the issue here, Howard, that I think is really important is that the, the, the cases that we're getting the numbers every day in almost real time are the numbers that you just gave as of last night. Uh, if you do the math on that, as we've done every day, it's remarkable that the uh, fatality rate, the case fatality rate has stayed at 2%. Uh, the issue is on conversations with our scientific colleagues uh, and public health colleagues in China, it's very clear that the people who are getting caught in that umbrella of, of reporting are the people who present themselves to a hospital. Uh, about 25%, as you mentioned, of these individuals have serious enough disease to put them in the intensive care unit. Um, however, there's a, another whole cohort that is either asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic that are gonna make that denominator uh, much, much larger than it is. And the, the reason I think this is important is because this is acting, if the, uh, for, if the case fatality rate goes down to a really, really bad flu season type uh, fatality. The fatality in a normal flu season is about 0.1%. When you get into the pandemics of 1957, 1968, it goes up to you know 0.8 to 1, 1.2. When you get to the 1918 pandemic, the famous Spanish flu that killed 50 to 100 million people, you go up to as much as 2%. So if this goes down 
to the one or 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1, 1.1. It's acting more like a really bad flu season or a pandemic flu that we've experienced. The reason I say this is that it's acting less like SARS, which has much less efficiency and transmissibility, but a death rate of nine to 10%, similar to MERS, which is not efficiently adapted to humans, it doesn't spread as well, but has a fatality of about 36%. So I think that we can say we don't know everything about this virus, but it's evolving in a way that looks like it's adapting itself to infecting much better, but we're gonna start seeing a diminution in the overall death rate. Yeah, you and I chatted about this briefly uh, before that we weren't quite sure what the denominator was. We were very good about counting the numerator, but the denominator was much more difficult. Tony, what's popped up in a um, number of viewpoints that's come across my desk, some of the literature is this, this row. Could you explain this R thing that people have been writing a lot about? Yeah, you know, the R ought is a population based um, determination that helps you to decide is the outbreak taking off, leveling off, or diminishing. So the R ought is the number of people that a single infected person will infect. So if I'm infected and I infect you, Howard, but you, I don't infect anybody else, the R ought is one. If I'm infected and I infect two people, the R ought is two. If I infect less than one, and, and you say, well, how can you infect less than one person? It's a population based. If, if a number of people, the average is that they infect less than one, then the, the outbreak is in decline. If one person infects one person, it's steady. As it goes above one, it goes up. So the, the R ought for this one is supposedly, and, and, and there's a lot of caveats with R oughts, but it's supposedly somewhere, you know, around two, two and a half, uh, three, you know, depending upon how you model it, which means that it is a virus that is quite good at transmitting from one person to another. So that, that's why when we went over the case fatality rate, it becomes so critically important because if you have an R naught of two, three, four, or five, and the case fatality rate is very high, then, then the world's going to struggle. If the case fatality rate is lower, even if the rates of infection are high, then I, I think we may be able to deal with it. Is that, is that an accurate interpretation, Tony? That's precisely correct, Howard. That's precisely correct. And you know, the, 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 the dictum that it was never 100%, but it holds true historically that when infections, particularly respiratory infections, the more efficiency they gain in spreading, uh, the less case fatality rate they have. There are some notable exceptions here, and that's when you really get a catastrophe, the way we had in 1918 with the famous Spanish flu that had a fatality rate that was much higher than seasonal flu. Seasonal flu is 0.1% seasonal flu fatality rate. When you go up to two and you have a wide spread where, you know, 40% of the population of the world gets infected, then you really got a problem. And that's what happened rarely in that incidence of uh, 1918. Now, remember the 2009 pandemic, the H1N1 swine flu, that spread very, very well, but the fatality rate was quite low. And that's the reason why it wasn't a, it wasn't dubbed as a particularly serious pandemic, even though it spread very rapidly. Now, Tony, we, we talked a little bit about China will return. So I'm curious about uh, your, your sense of uh, the quarantine uh, that's not just in China, but now with other countries. Where are we? Where are we at in the United States? N a number of cases travel in and out from China. Where are we? In, where are we in the United States? Okay, we have now 
12 confirmed cases in the United States. Nine of them are direct travel cases from Wuhan City in China. The two other cases are spouses of two of the travel related cases for a total of 12. Now you bring up the point, Howard, about travel restrictions. You know, in general, historically, and I've been one that has even spoken about this, that travel restrictions in general don't do much to stop the entry of infection when there is a broad global pandemic, because you can't restrict travel for the whole world. What it does do when you have travel restriction from a particular country or particular region, at best it delays such that you hope that it delays the outbreak in your country long enough so that the country that is the epicenter, in this case China, controls it to the point that you put a lid on the outbreak. Once you get a broad global pandemic, it, it, it's folly to do any travel restrictions because you can't cut yourself off from the rest of the world. But the rationale of the Chinese in putting the restrictions in their own country is to prevent the spread within their country. And the rationale for temporary travel restrictions is to try and keep that number of travel related cases as low as possible because right now what you have is the 12 cases and the nine of which were travel were appropriately and accurately and correctly and successfully identified, isolated, and the contacts were traced. If you have a very, very large number of those travel related cases, it becomes logistically very difficult to do that. A figure that I did not appreciate at all until I got involved in it is that prior to this outbreak, there were 22,000 people a day would come from China to the United States. Even though that has cut down considerably, if you want to screen in a way that is, you know, uh, accurate uh, and have an impact, people who are coming in, it would overwhelm the system. And it was for that reason that the health officials felt they couldn't really even give the beginning of a guarantee that that kind of screening would be effective. So it was felt that at least on a temporary basis, let's shut off the faucet for a while to see where this is going. That was the rationale for the travel restrictions. But in general, Travel restrictions don't stop outbreaks. They merely delay uh, it getting into a particular region. Well, it certainly takes uh, any country, the U.S., any country in Europe or other countries in Asia, a few days uh, uh, to, to gear up to be able to begin to screen and right. then, then quarantine. So from that perspective, I can understand it. Tony, let, let's go through some of the co more common details that always come up. For example... You know, one of the issues that came up over the last couple of days was so-called asymptomatic transmission incubation period. And do we know any anything more about antivirals? But let's start with right. asymptomatic transmission. Presumably someone's right. coming into the country, you take their temperature, do they have a fever? But what about everyone else who doesn't have a fever? Sure. That's a very important point, And there has been some confusion about that. Let's just quickly uh, start off with the incubation period. You know, classically in coronaviruses and with this virus, it was felt that the incubation period was anywhere from two days to 14 days. Right now, speaking to our Chinese colleagues, the incubation period is probably between five and six, maybe closer to five days. So the question is, is there asymptomatic infection? And can an asymptomatic person transmit infection? As you mentioned appropriately, if there is asymptomatic transmission to any degree, it makes any sort of screening process difficult and problematic. So we were hearing reports, Howard, from Chinese colleagues that there is clearly asymptomatic infection and they are seeing 
clear evidence of some asymptomatic transmission. It's not the driver of the outbreak, but they feel confident that it's happening. These are only anecdotal reports. The New England Journal of Medicine uh, last week or so came out with a report of a Chinese woman from Shanghai who went on a business trip to Germany, had business type casual contact with a German person at a time when she claims that she was, well, she didn't claim, the paper claimed that she was without symptoms. She then went back and on the plane going back to China, she developed symptoms and when she got there, the diagnosis was made. So the uh, conclusion was that this was the first documented case of a person who in the asymptomatic state transmitted it. It became pretty well discussed because it would have been the first, you know, published report of something that has some policy implications. Then it found out that when they really questioned this woman carefully, she really was not completely asymptomatic. She had some back pain, uh, some fatigue, and she was taking an anti-inflammatory uh, or a painkiller. I think it was almost like an acetaminophen uh, derivative. So all of a sudden, the conclusion coming from that case was now in question and the paper, at least for the time being, is flawed until maybe they find out that she actually really was asymptomatic. That created a problem. So I figured I might as well just grab the bull by the horns. Right. <laughs> so I, I made a call to a person who I know very well who is a highly respected scientist and public health official in China. And I said, it's important for us to get the answer to two important questions. A, is there asymptomatic infection? Absolutely, yes. B, can an asymptomatic person transmit it? Absolutely, we've seen it. It's not the predominant mode by any means. It's not driving the outbreak, but it occurs. So we're left with a situation where we don't know what the impact of this is it's likely minimal impact on the kinetics of the outbreak, but what kind of an impact would it have on testing? And the reason we want to go over there as part of the WHO group is to do things like finding out the people who are asymptomatic, do they, when do they get carriage of virus in the nasal passages? Is that virus transmissible virus? Is it replication competent? or is it just PCR identifiable? These are very critical things. So this comes under the realm, Howard, of information we don't know that we need to know. Yeah, it's interesting, Tony. In the case series, which, um, as I said, we've held on to for a day to really clarify the facts that we're putting up tomorrow, I'll just read the most common signs and symptoms from these 138 individuals. Fever, 99%. Fatigue, 69%. Dry cough, 59%. Anorexia, 39%. Myalgia, 34 But then they get into less common ones. And so it really becomes hard to know if someone is truly asymptomatic. Diarrhea, 10%. Nausea, 10%. Dizziness, 9%. Headache and vomiting, 6 and 3%. So I think defining asymptomatic becomes difficult. Tony, one of the questions that's come through... Um, uh, is uh, um, transmission only through respiratory droplets? Well, again, I cannot say that definitively, uh, uh, Howard, because uh, we haven't done the studies to prove or disprove that. I mean, uh, assuming, assuming this is a disease that involves the lungs, that involves coughing, in which you have virus in the respiratory tree and the upper airway, it's almost certain that it's respiratory born. The question is, is it only respiratory born? And we don't know that. Uh, I, I don't know that right now. I think we're assuming, and I think it's a reasonable assumption. We don't want to go way off the wall on this. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it would act like any other coronavirus that's respiratory born. There has been some reports about virus in the stool, in people, you mentioned diarrhea, that is isolated from the stool, but we better be careful that is that live virus, or is that just remnants of virus that you're picking up by PCR? A virus in the stool is an RNA virus, 
would not survive very well. So I think what you're going to probably hear about is some reports about virus in the stool and what role does that have yeah. in the spread of infection? I think the answer is we don't know. Uh, and we need to find out because that has important implications. Now, in the report that we're putting up tomorrow, virtually every person got antibacterials as well as many got antivirals, particularly those in the ICU. But there's no, it, it, they couldn't, uh, they weren't clear about the benefit of, of either. Um, in, in the case series we're putting up, the mortality rate was 4.3%. But obviously, this included um, many individuals who were quite ill. They were in the intensive care unit. Right. Uh, Tony, anything emerge emerging yet other than symptomatic treatment? Uh, no, there are there are clinical protocols being developed for antivirals that we already have available, such as remdesivir, which you remember was used as one of the uh, therapies in the forearm trial of Ebola infection. It was not did not prove to be effective, but it has in vitro antiviral activity. In addition. Uh, a anti-HIV drug, Kaletra, which is a combination of two drugs, ritonavir and lapinavir, and those two drugs, you know, are prote being protease in inhibitors, and there's protease in this particular virus. Again, there are going to be clinical protocols to see if we can figure out. Uh, the Chinese are doing it now. If we go over there, and when we go over there, we'd like to help out and be involved in that. Um, so there are. You're absolutely correct. There are no direct, proven uh, anti antivirals at all uh, that we know are proven, but there are some with some hint which are being pursued both in a compassionate use basis as well as on a clinical trials which are being developed. Uh, Howard, one thing I do want to bring up that I was struck by in, in your very graciously showing me uh, the preprint of the paper that's going to be coming out is that when you talk about the stories from the 1918 pandemic where someone would wake up in the morning, feel pretty well, go to work, fall down in the street, and then be dead in about 24 hours. That's the great frightening thing about the 1918 pandemic. Obviously not everybody went through that, but that's something that keeps getting repeated in the historical type of uh, discussions of that outbreak. The thing that was really interesting, I thought, in the paper, if you look at the duration of time yeah. from onset of symptoms to hospitalization, I believe it was five days. Right. Uh, from, the, uh, from the hospitalization to the ICU was seven days. Right. And from uh, onset of symptoms to, I think it was intubation, was eight days. What that's telling you is that this virus is really acting different. This virus, when it gets in you, it adapts itself so that you can wind up days later getting really serious disease. So I think, you know, JAMA being uh, a journal that clinicians throughout the world read, I think that's a heads up if somebody comes in and has moderate to minimal symptoms, stay heads up for some deterioration over the next few days. Didn't you get that out of that? Yeah, no. I, I, yeah, no. Um, and it, it, this is for the, the 36 of the 138 who ended up in the ICU. The median time from first symptoms to dyspnea was five days, to hospital admission seven days, and to ARDS was eight days. So I think you know, you're just raising the point that just because you're well on day one or two doesn't mean you'll be uh, you'll necessarily be day you'll be well on day four, five, or six. Yeah, I was definitely struck by that. Uh, Tony, um, uh, cases out. Uh, so, firstly, um, mo most people who are hospitalized seriously ill presenting with pneumonia. That's the first, and then the second, the cases outside of China seem those individuals seem less ill. Can you comment yeah. on both the pneumonia issue? What percent are presenting with pneumonia and then uh, the spectrum of illness outside of China? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I'm getting, you know, as you might imagine, I get uh, thousands of emails right, of people right. who, who have theories about things. But one thing is, is starting to be noticed. And, and it, it, isn't, it hasn't been done in a regimented, scientific, organized way. But it appears that... The, the travel-related cases 
that are outside of China that then transmit to other people, it appears that somehow or other, it, not a lot of them are catastrophic infection. But I think the N is too small, Howard. So I would be very reluctant to make any even guess or discussion that disease in Wuhan is much more serious than disease either in other parts of China or outside of China where you have infection. People are talking about that. And I think it's something we just need to watch really closely. I cannot imagine why that would be the case. But, you know, you get surprised when you when you follow brand new diseases. So going to keep an eye out on that. Right. I mean, the other issue is that most of the case series, one we're publishing, a couple that have already been published, it's really, it, it's behaving in many regards like, like flu in the sense that it's, it's the, uh, the elderly with comorbid conditions, and we'll report oh, yeah. that tomorrow, yeah. that are really, yeah. uh, uh, seem to be most susceptible to needing uh, ICU services or ultimately to dying. Right. You know, um, this virus doesn't seem to be an equal opportunity attacker. I think striking was see is the is the paucity of children who come up with with infection or even serious disease the mean the mean, the average age i think was something like 56 was it in the paper how it was something yes, like yeah 50. yeah now just to let our listeners know again i'll, I'll serve as our own preprint uh and and that uh, that goes to the issue about children. Uh, I think the listeners probably know that I am a pediatrician, and and that always comes up when when we have these epidemic pandemics. How are children f uh, going to do? Um, Jody Zelke, who's uh, our research letter editor, deputy editor, also a pediatrician, uh, just finished uh, uh, back and forth, uh, and will be editing a, a research letter, which is a, a very small case series about. Uh, infants with the disease all have done well. We're hoping that that will come out over the weekend. Um, and then we have another paper coming out tomorrow, which uh, again, another research letter about a small number of children. But it has been striking so far, Tony, that in most of the literature, there has been very little about children. Right. Right. And it's true. Yeah. So the, the, the two reports that will come out with will be amongst the first. Um, any any concerns about maternal fetal transmission? I mean, many, many women around the world are obviously pregnant. Um, any information about that? How, how um, or is there, is there an analogy with flu that would be helpful or MERVs or, or uh, SARS that would be helpful uh, about maternal uh, uh, yeah. fetal transmission? Well, there was a newspaper report. I mean, he, here we are, my goodness, newspaper reports <laughs> of a woman who had the coronavirus, who gave birth, and 30 hours later, the baby came up with uh, symptoms and was diagnosed with the disease. So it brings up the question of vertical transmission. The problem with that, Howard, and, and even going back to the second part of your question of do we have any insight from influenza, the problem with making those kinds of determinations is the postnatal close contact mm. between a mother and a baby in a viral infection that has an incubation period of as low as two and sometimes one day. I mean, the Chinese are saying that it could be as low as one day. They say it's anywhere between two and five with an average of five. It really becomes impossible to say that it was vertical um, versus the mother gave it to the baby right at birth and the baby developed symptoms 30 hours later because it has a low incubation period. Um, you know, I, I don't think you're gonna get definitive proof unless you really do some very serious studies on a number of individuals. I don't think you could make on the basis of an N equals one or two any determination of that. Tony, just one or two more questions. I know we've been on for almost uh, 30, 35 minutes, but it's, you're such an extraordinary resource. I, again, I can't thank you enough. Um, one of the questions that's come through social media, interestingly enough, and I, I find this one interesting, is um, blood supply. Um, you, you know, you, 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 live that, you live through that with HIV. This is very, very different. But I'm, I'm just curious, um, 
how quickly um, d- does um, d- d- can you sort through whether or not you have to worry uh, about this vis-a-vis yeah. blood supply, blood transfusions? Yeah, I mean that's something work that the FDA obviously is is all over working on that right now. The way you go through is you find out if in fact you get someone who's infected, you follow them, and you find out the degree of viremia. I mean, are, are these people viremic, or do they just have virus in the lung and in the nasal passage? That is going to be absolutely critical, and that's the reason why the FDA is very interested in that. No determinations right now. You know, the better part of valor. You know, it's also going to be how often uh, it's unlikely that someone with coronavirus is going to decide they want to, you know, when they're sick, uh, donate blood. I but then hope. you get to what you were saying. What about asymptomatic right. infection? So all of the questions come up, Howard, and, and, and they're, they're self-cascading questions. A, is it viremic? How long do they shed virus? When you're infected and asymptomatic, are you also viremic or not? Who is and who is not viremic? And how long are they viremic? All of those things are open questions that absolutely need to be settled before you make any determination about any impact on the blood supply. So last two questions, one is going backwards and one is going forward. For, so let's go backwards. Um, uh, any more information about uh, where it came from? Uh, no, I mean, obviously, if you look at the history of these viruses, we have uh, SARS, which we know after much experimenting in epidemiological, molecular epidemiology, it went from a bat to a civet cat to a human. MERS went from a bat to a camel to a human. If you look at the phylogenetic trees of the coronaviruses, there are only four of the coronaviruses that account for 10 to 30 percent of the common cold, but clustered around those phylogenetic branches are a whole bunch of bat viruses. If you do the sequencing, you can make an assumption that a bat was involved one way or another, either primarily or giving it to an intermediate host. So that's the likely issue. Having said that, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories, as you know, going around on the internet, with social media, about deliberate or accidental release, et cetera, et cetera. I think the answers to all of those will come when you get a whole bunch of sequences and you trace the evolution of this. Because if you look at the red flag markers of mutations as a virus evolves from the bat group all the way into human, you can get a pretty good idea of how it evolved and what happened as it got into humans. So the the last question, then I'll have some final comments. So the Harry Potter sorting hat, I mean, sort of feel like I should make you put it on. Tony, I know people want to know what's the next two, three, four weeks going to look like, both in China and around the world. Yeah. You know, um, I, if I knew that, I'd feel a lot more comfortable <laughs> than I feel right now, Howard. Yeah. I can see that... Um, the, the the virus and the and the pattern of disease continues to accelerate. You know, it goes up by a couple of thousand sometimes um, cases per day. I think in the next few weeks to a month, we're going to find out is it turning the corner and coming down, which would be really very encouraging news, or is it continuing to go skyrocketing? I can tell you that if it acts like a coronavirus, whether by its natural dynamics, it turns around over the next month or so, that would be great. Even if it doesn't by natural dynamics, when you start getting into the spring weather of April, May, and June, it almost certainly would turn around. But I would like to see it turn around by its own natural kinetics as opposed to the warm weather is here, so it's not spreading very well. And then when we get next winter, it comes right back. Mm. So I think the next two to four weeks are going to be absolutely critical to see what direction this is going. Uh, this is Howard Bachner, editor-in-chief of JAMA. I, I've been talking with Tony Fauci. Tony, again, on behalf of our listeners, JAMA, uh, the U.S., people around the world, thank you. I, I do want to emphasize that 
we have a coronavirus educational center. We've put up a number of opinion pieces. We'll be putting up two very, very important research papers tomorrow and then a couple over the weekend. Um, I'm sure we'll pepper some of the research papers with more opinion pieces. Um, we've made these free to the world. Many are being translated into simple Chinese. And I, I would be remiss um, not to thank everyone who I work with at JAMA. Um, Tony knows his viewpoint came in and went up in three days. We are really trying to process these papers quickly. We realize it's a public health emergency. On the other hand, for us, it's critically important to make sure that what we put up is accurate and true. So occasionally we have held up a paper or two for a day or so. But we're working literally around the clock to try to get up papers quickly and to make them freely available to the world. Tony, um, maybe again in two or three weeks we'll chat. But again, thank you so very, very much for taking the time. My pleasure, Howard. Always good to be with you. And I look forward to continuing this as we move on. Get some sleep and please stay healthy. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, Take Tony. Care. All right. Bye bye. Okay, Howard, take care. Good to be with you, as always.